Italian playboy commits the world's largest armed robbery. Triggering a world-class game of cat and mouse. For many young men, vandalism is a rite of passage. But Valerio Vici was an overachiever. On January 6, 1972, at age 17, he began his criminal career with a bang. When he helped blow up a television tower. Vici had no use for subtlety, and the fireworks would follow him the rest of his life. In his northern Italian hometown of Ascoli Pensino, Vici was considered just another good kid gone bad. But nobody knew just how bad. Sì, sí. sì, sí. signore, scusi. Dove Valario? Valario. E qui. Valario sta qui. E sta. Vici came from an educated middle-class home. Valario, Valario. His father and brother were lawyers. His mother ran a boutique. They resigned themselves to the fact that Valerio was the black sheep. Incorrigible, spoiled, and thanks to his rebellious streak, under arrest. Come l'hai fatto? For the young Vici, prison was a learning experience. Era semplice. The thieves and con men had much to share. And Vici was an apt pupil. The subject he enjoyed the most, he would study for the rest of his life. How to steal other people's money. Upon his release, Vici began robbing post offices in nearby villages. His notoriety grew. According to Detective James Goldie, Vici's charm and daring quickly made him a celebrity. He would walk in, and instead of pointing the gun, he would hold up one of his newspaper clippings. And the lady behind the counter would say, ah, the bandido, and hand over all the money. But fame has its downside. Vici soon found himself back in jail. He wasted no time resuming his studies. He was an accomplished criminal by the time he reached his late 20s. In the small town where he lived, he found himself on the law's short list of suspects whenever a robbery was committed. The relentless police pressure began to cramp his style. Vici realized that the Italian authorities wouldn't let up until they nailed him. He wouldn't give them the satisfaction. Instead, he packed up and fled the country. He first went to Switzerland to open a bank account and throw police off his trail. Using fake passports, he eventually settled in London, where he had some friends. At first, he didn't know enough English to order a cup of coffee. But he was intelligent. He studied and learned fast. Soon he was back in business, according to reporter James Nicholson. He stayed low for a while. Not very long, though. He was back. He'd seen our banks. He'd seen what was happening. And he thought, I would need money. 
and he started robbing our banks. That very year he came here. The Italian bandit robbed five British banks in a matter of months. He moved in and out so quickly, nobody could identify him. And unlike his native Italy, British security guards weren't armed. Vici was quickly becoming a rich man. Vici believed that banks were only good for withdrawing other people's money. For his own wealth, he required something more secure. He kept his stolen assets in a private deposit box near his apartment. Meanwhile, Vici lived the good life in luxurious St. John's Wood. When he wasn't stealing, he passed himself off as an Italian journalist trying to learn English. People naturally assumed he'd come from a wealthy family. Despite his own growing fortune, Vici envied the easy wealth of his rich acquaintances. Always on the lookout for a big score, he was intrigued to learn that his friends kept their valuables in the largest deposit center in London. To Vici, the Knightsbridge deposit center brimmed with treasure and opportunity. Located in one of London's most prestigious neighborhoods, the vault featured state-of-the-art security. Vici's surveillance revealed automated locks, two-foot-thick walls, bulletproof glass, and video surveillance. He realized this was no job for a bandit, even one as remarkable as himself. No, to hit Knightsbridge, he'd have to alter his M.O. Posing as a successful businessman, Vici began making regular deposits. He played the part perfectly and refined his scheme with every visit. This promised to be the biggest heist of Vici's career. To pull it off required a subtle plan, a deft touch, and some inside information. Vici studied everything he could about the deposit center. He noted who came in and who went out, and at what time. He befriended the owner, Parvez Latif, to find weaknesses in his operation. But Latif's girlfriend proved to be even more useful. In order to rob the Knightsbridge Deposit Center, Vici first stole Latif's girlfriend. She revealed that Latif was in financial trouble and had an expensive drug habit. Anybody was going for uh, this smooth talking uh, Valerio and uh, she more or less fell for him. With the information Vici gathered, he formulated his plan. Stealing millions of dollars required millions of details. He'd need tools to break into the boxes and a safe house to store all the loot. And he'd have to be out by 5.30 p.m. when the security chief arrived. To get in and out in time, he would need help. Vici recruited a gang. 
Since he wanted most of the money and all of the glory, he hired small-time crooks. He'd be the brains. They'd provide the brawn. They'd work cheap, and the police would never suspect them. With the men and the details in place, all Vici had to do was find the perfect time to set in motion the biggest and most dangerous heist of his career. The time had come for Valerio Vici to risk everything for the biggest heist of his life. Let us through, please. Let us through. On July 12, 1987, Vici took one of his accomplices to the deposit center and introduced him to Latif as a prospective client. Latif was only too happy to provide a tour of the elaborate facilities. The three men entered a private viewing room inside the vault. The one place the security cameras couldn't reach. But uh, I have just the one problem. My cases are empty, and I need you to listen to me very good, okay? First thing, I don't want to hurt. Latif asked the guard to show his guests the security features of the depository. As soon as the men were in the security booth, Vici captured the guard. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, you're done. All right. We go into the other room. I, I change it to the post. Let's go. Nose against the wall. Vishnu, nose against the wall. But one more remained. Vici and his accomplice forced Latif to call the front desk and asked the guard to bring some brochures to his office. Now no one stood between Don't the robbers and their goal. I want you to stick your face against the wall. Ciao, boys. Vici radioed to his men. Gino. But there was no response. Gino. Vici had no choice but to leave the building to retrieve them. They were right where they should have been. Their walkie-talkie was simply tuned to the wrong frequency. The error cost them precious time. Because of the breakdown in communications, when he had to physically go out and come back in again, he was then working against the clock because there was a physical um, security check done around about 5.30. It was after 4 o'clock. Vici and his gang went right to work. They had little over an hour to crack hundreds of boxes. They were 20 minutes behind schedule, so they were banging away at these boxes with sledgehammers. Oh, meanwhile, all the guards, including the chief, are handcuffed and away from it all. And it was like a 20th century Aladdin's cave for them. Gold, silver coming out, and pound notes, and dollars galore. Time was up. Although the men had opened only 120 of the nearly 5,000 security boxes, they needed to get out of there. In his haste, Vici cut himself. 
he had to keep moving. A crucial detail remained. Before Latif joined the chained up guards, Vici gave him a wad of cash. The clever burglar had duped everyone. Even Vici's own gang didn't know that Latif was the inside man. Minutes before the security chief arrived, the gang disguised themselves and loaded the goods into a nondescript van. By the time the Knightsbridge security advisor arrived at 5.30, the gang was long gone. Latif played his part perfectly. He had scheduled new guards who wouldn't recognize Vici. Neither of them could describe the robbers' faces. Latif also made sure a technical glitch rendered the security cameras useless. Stuck it right to your head, isn't it? Right there. Police were astounded by the scope of the crime. Detective James Goldie was at the scene. Every time a detective walks into a situation similar to this, albeit that this was a very unique situation, I felt personally there was an inside, there had to be an inside connection for this robbery to have taken place. The problem we had, of course, was who was the inside contact. And how much had been taken. Only the box holders really knew. If the remaining cash and gems were any indication, the robbers had made off with millions. The evidence was scant, a single bloody fingerprint. Investigators knew they had to work fast, or the money was as good as gone. What they didn't know was that Valerio Beachy had already fled the country. News of the Knightsbridge heist spread quickly. Distraught box holders lined up outside the deposit center to help police estimate how much was lost. James Nicholson covered the story. It was a big robbery at a place which is in the middle of uh, Kensington, adjacent to Knightsbridge. And this is where the rich, the famous aristocrats, members of the royal family live, and use this particular uh, safe deposit box. And we knew immediately that it happened. I got a call, would I cover it? And I went there to cover it and I saw people queuing outside, some in tears, who had lost all their belongings. Estimates kept climbing. Five million pounds, 20 million, 40 million pounds or more. Among the lost treasures was the 42 carat Flick diamond, owned by the family who controls Mercedes-Benz, worth 1.5 million pounds. A true figure of the losses was difficult to gauge but it was the biggest armed robbery of all time. As Scotland Yard investigated the heist, they became convinced the robbers had inside help. Police ran the sole fingerprint through the files of criminals in the United Kingdom. There was no match. When they sent it to Interpol, they got a hit on an Italian criminal named Valerio Vici. As British detectives learned more about Vici's reputation as a playboy, they began to theorize that the inside man at Knightsbridge might be a woman. There were several young uh, girls who worked in the safe deposit center. Um, once we had established the identity of Valerio Vici, and his um, bona fides, the, the glamour boy with the fast car, the drugs, and the playboy lifestyle, of course, it looked, uh, there was a possibility that any one of three girls could have been seduced by, by Vici. While the police scoured Britain for Vici, he continued playing the game. 
He ordered an expensive sports car and slipped back into the country to get it. So many opportunities to have fled the country and yet you kept coming back again. But of course he wanted to live on the edge. He wasn't happy just being an ordinary bank robber. Provided with information from Italian authorities, British police kept Vici's associates under observation. Their joint effort was Vici's undoing. A month after the heist, police observed the robber leaving an upscale London hotel in his Ferrari. They arrested him as he waited for an export license to take the Ferrari to South America. He never believed he'd be caught. He should have gone the previous week and the party would have come over to South America. But he stayed on. And had he not stayed on, you'd have never seen him here again. Tell me a little In more custody, Vici gave the authorities his inside man. Detectives could hardly believe Latif, that Parvez Latif was involved. On first statement. sight, he would probably have been one of the last one people you would have suspected well. as being the inside man. He wasn't a strong person, he was a very weak individual. And I really think even though the, 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 he was aware of the drama that was about to unfold, I think that during the process of the robbery, that the way Vici conducted it, he conducted it for real. And as a consequence, Latif was genuinely frightened. Latif was no match for Vici's brand of persuasion. So it was a simple job for Vici to say to him, look, this is the deal. I will rob you save the deposit center and we can share the spoils. In the months prior to the robbery, Latif had increased his business insurance from $1 million to $3 million. He had every reason to help Vici with the robbery. Vici was very aware of the vulnerability of Pavez Latif. Um, his business was not doing well. He was under financial pressure. He was a cocaine user, and Vici had access to a lot of cocaine. So he was able to give Latif everything that he needed. He was able to give him cocaine, and he was able to give him a way out of his dilemma because Latif was losing money fast. Eventually, 10 million out of an estimated 60 million pounds worth of gems, precious metals, and currency was recovered and taken to Scotland Yard. Included was the Flick Diamond. One million pounds worth of the recovered riches was never claimed, including a 150,000 pound necklace of diamonds and rubies and a 25,000 pound Cartier watch. When all attempts at finding the owners failed, they were auctioned at Christie's in December 1992. Parvez Latif was sentenced to 18 years in prison. The rest of the gang was arrested and served time. Valerio Vici was sentenced to 22 years for the Knightsbridge caper. While in custody, he also confessed to five other unsolved robberies in England. That brought his record to 54 robberies in Italy and England. I said to him, you know, what would you have done if you had got away with this and you hadn't been caught? He said, I would have opened up a drive-in bank and robbed it. Now, he was never, ever not going to rob another bank. It was just really a question of time before he got around to his next one. After serving only four years in England, Vici was extradited to his native Italy. Despite his long criminal history, he was given day release, requiring him to return to prison only at night. In April 2000, Valerio Vici was gunned down on a country road after firing on Italian police. In his car were masks and weapons. At the age of 45, his days as the Playboy Bandit were over.